1 Samuel chapter 16, starting at verse 1. If you could and would, please stand with me. If you noticed, uh, we skipped uh, for the size and the, uh, for the page, they skipped verse 5. Uh, so I'll be reading it from the Bible once we get there. Young David, anointed king. We need more godly leaders. Verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from ringing over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will shew thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and he said peaceably, I am come to sacrifice... Uh, to the Lord, sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to sacrifice. Verse 6, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Elab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Amen. Verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord had not chosen these. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for he will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel, verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. You can be seated. Amen. Young David anointed king. Amen. We need some more godly leaders. We know the Bible states that David was a man after God's own heart. You know why David was a man after God's own heart? He was chosen. He was given and he received, he was chosen. And as the body of Christ, we must realize that we are chosen. The Lord has received us, and we ought to walk as leaders. Say, well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a this, I'm not a that. I'm not. You are a leader of your house home, you are a leader of your family, you can be a leader in your neighborhood and your workplace. Uh, we know Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to be leaders. Amen. <coughs> Anointing's different for different people. God uses people in different ways. Uh, amen. And we went through that with all uh, the women of the Bible. Uh, but we're going to see about this here uh, with uh, David. Amen. I'll jump right to the questions. Question number one says, Who was the first king of Israel? And what finally precipitated his rejection by God? We'd have to jump back into uh, the chapters and, and see what's going on. But it was Saul. We know Saul was king. He was God's anointed. The Bible says it very clear. Uh, he was God's anointed, but he was rejected. Why was he rejected? He was told to kill uh, all the Melkites, and he did not do that. He kept the king, and they kept the chief of the spoils, and he also sacrificed unto God. Uh, Samuel was not there, and he decided to do it on his own. So what did he do? He was playing the role as a priest. He was trying to be the preacher. There's lots of people this day and time, they're trying to be the preacher. Uh, it's not an easy position. It's not, uh, you've got to be God called to do God's work as a 
priest, so to say, as a preacher, so to say, a God-called man. I have too many people this day and time, just as well as Saul, uh, does not fit the position in which they are called. Uh, there's a difference. There's those that he talks about, Timothy, they desire the office uh, of a bishop, and it's a good thing. Uh, but simply a man, woman, boy, or girl has got to be called into roles of leadership. Did you say woman there? Yes, I did. Women ought to be leading women. The Bible's very clear about it, that the elders of the church are to teach the youngers and how to be modest and how to be discreet, how to be chastened, how to be a God-fearing woman. Amen. We all have a role to play. Saul was king, and Saul was supposed to be doing his bidding, but he also tried to do to do Samuel's and when he did that he sacrificed God said look it's enough I want to give you this verse he left king he was supposed to kill him and he didn't uh, let me give you this verse this is what uh, Samuel told him he said had the Lord as great delight after he did this burnt offering he said had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rounds. So he says we ought to obey God's word. Now watch this. For us present day and time, Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse uh, 17 says this, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. God has structured the church when he saves the soul. He places them the way he has for a reason. Uh, that's why it's called a called out assembly. This church ain't going to be the right church for everybody. That church ain't going to be the right church for everybody. But God knows how to put it together. We just got to let God. But God does put people in leadership for a reason. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that might give account. The preacher, the pastor is going to give account in how he watched for souls. He's very clear about it. Watch this, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. If you cause the man of God grief, the Bible is very clear that says it's unprofitable for you to cause the man of God grief. What happened here? The Bible said that after this happened, it said that, that Samuel never seen Saul again, and it grieved him, and he mourned him, and God even had to tell Samuel, it's done, I've rejected him. You've got to quit mourning over that. These things happen. These things take place. And God says you still must uh, move forward. Uh, amen. So, he, so the question, answer the question, <coughs> uh, who was the first king? It was Saul. He tried to play the role as priest, uh, and he did not king, uh, kill King Aglai. Then Samuel had to wind up doing that. Samuel also had to take the sword. If you read into the uh, full chapter 15, he also had to take his sword and kill the king, uh, amen, that Saul didn't kill, amen. We're going to verse, question two. Uh, why was Samuel told to go? Where was Samuel told to go? And what was the potential problem he was worried about? Now we start where we, in our text, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, we read it. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil, watch it, and go. I will send thee. When God says something, he means it. He said, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So uh, where was Samuel told to go, and what was the potential problem he was worried about? He was told to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse because Saul has rejected, he's disobeyed God, he's done wrong. His rebellion, Samuel even said, is as the sin of witchcraft. He said, can I you understand that this morning? Sin is sin. When you decide to rebel against God and you decide to heed to temptation and give in to that, uh, the Bible's very clear. That's a type of rebellion. And he said, and, and it's so easy for the, for the Christian that gives in to I sin to point the finger at someone that's lost doing witchcraft, but he says it's as that sin. Yeah. And he said stubbornness. <laughs> Listen to that. Stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. To be stubborn, to not listen to God's word. He said, he told, he told uh, Samuel told Saul, 
He said, you have rejected God's word. Therefore, he has rejected you. You know what happened after that? Saul worshiped the Lord. How stupid is that? Well, it don't sound pretty stupid to me. It happens. There's so many people this day and time, they have pick and choose what they want from this book. They have been rejected. They want to do things their own way, yet they still worship the Lord. The Bible's very clear. He did. He could, it's verse 31, it says, So Samuel turned again after Saul, watch it, and Saul worshiped the Lord. And then that's when uh, Samuel went and killed the king that he was supposed to. Uh, amen. So he sent him to Bethlehem that he can anoint the new king, which we know to be King David, uh, but we're not there yet into this story. But the question is, and I want to point this out, it says, what is the potential problem that Samuel was worried about? This great prophet, the greatest prophet God had, what's the potential problem? Is that Saul would know why he was there. He would know that he's coming in there. He's a king over the land, Saul was, and he knew when people came in what was going on. And he was scared that Saul would kill him, though he was God's man. Can I tell you it's like that? God will tell you and I to do something, and if it ain't the devil himself, your own flesh, your own desires, your own thoughts, or somebody close to you, all of a sudden you'll be lied to. God didn't tell you to do that. Don't go do that. Look, God was very clear. He said, I have rejected him over reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee. God said, go. I will send thee. When God says he's going to do something, bless God, he's going to do it. If God tells you to go witness to that person, go witness to that person. Don't let the devil out of you. Amen. The, the, God tells you to surrender to the ministry doing this or that. Do it. Don't let the devil lie to you because he will every time. Amen. And that's exactly, even to, even to, uh, to uh, Sam, it's what he did here. Now watch this. He said the potential problem. I got thinking about that and I just wrote it down this morning. The potential problem. Instead of worrying about the potential problems that we might have in ministry, instead you and I must be aware of the protection, amen, and the provision of God Almighty. If God said, if I be for you, who could be against you? If I send you, then I've sent you. Well, what can you do? I've had to learn that the hard way. Bless God, I'm just going to buckle down. I, I, I've told a few people just this week, I get tighter and tighter in my fundamental, independent, 1611, King James, blood-bought, salvation shell. I'm like a turtle that you ain't getting out of that shell. Uh, amen. Praise the Lord. Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Watch it. To them who are the called. It didn't say that's going to be that I'm working on. He said that who are amen. the called according to his purpose. God has a purpose. It's his purpose. What shall we say to these things? Of God before us, who could be against us? What was that right there? This great prophet of God, anointed as a baby, grew up. He was being lied to in his conscience and by others around him. I'm sure that in the devil lying to him. He's the father of lies. Amen. The devil will discourage you. Amen. He will take away your encouragement. He'll do whatever he can to bring you down. Amen. But we have victory over that. He don't have to. If God says we are the called, bless God, we're the called. Amen. And we've got to understand and we've got to realize and we've got to take these things serious, amen, so that you and I, the, the day and time, we need more power in the church, bless God. Yeah. And, and the only way that we're going to get power in the church, amen, is that we take these things that God has told us and take him at his word. Why ain't we in the government? Why ain't we in the school systems? Why ain't we in the church houses? Because we ain't got no power. Because we're not taking God at his word. Uh, amen. And his word's truth. He told him, he told Samuel, I, I will send you. And then what does he do? He just doubts. Amen. You and I can go for God. If you're going for the Lord Jesus Christ, can't nobody stop you. Ain't nobody going to stop you. Just go for the Lord Jesus Christ and he will help you. Amen. Question three, how did God provide protection for Samuel? So there was truth behind it. There, there is some truth behind it because God responded with this in, in verse 2. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to, the, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. He told him to sacrifice. 
He told him to worship. Because the fact of the matter is, if Saul seen him, he probably would have killed him. But he said, here, just take your... He was known, Samuel was known, when he went places to do the Lord's bidding, that he took a sacrifice with him. And he would, he would have the people sanctify themselves and cleanse them and then do uh, as he was supposed to uh, as the man of God. Uh, amen. So what, what did he do? How did he provide protection for Samuel? He told him to worship. Amen. Praise God. How do you and I be protected in this world? We worship. There's something about that neighbor that lives next door to you or behind you or around you that sees you get up every Sunday and if you're coming back Sunday night and Wednesday, they know that you're going somewhere and they know where you're going. They know you're going to church. What do we go to church for? We go to worship. We need the worship. We need the protection of Almighty God. We need the remembrance. We need the reminding of the things of God in our life. And that's what he's telling him. He said, well, well, just take your sacrifice. He said, Saul will see it. And he's just saying, all you're doing is worshiping anyway. But I think it was God's way of almost slapping him in his face and showing him this man is the man that's supposed to be doing these things here. Amen. Watch this for us day and time. Hebrews 13. Remember we talked about obeying them that has the rule over you. Uh, the men of God having respect for them, submitting yourselves before they watch for your souls. But before that verse... In verse 12 of Hebrews 13, it's talking about Jesus and how his blood has sanctified you and I. Amen. He has sanctified us. And we've got to remember, this is Old Testament Scripture in Samuel. We're living in the New Testament. We've been born again. We're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ by faith and faith alone. Amen. Now watch this. In 15, he says, By him, talking about Jesus, the one that we're sanctified by his blood, Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. People say you can't pray all the time. They say you can't praise all the time. Sometimes I just wonder, like, my soul, does God live in you? That's what the Holy Ghost does. The Holy Ghost constantly has my mind fixed on the things of God. If it ain't praying, if, watch this, if it ain't praying, and if it ain't praising, it's be, I'm being convicted that I ought to be praying, that I ought to be praising, or that I ought to be doing something godly for God. Amen. He said, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. This is worship. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Amen. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. Watch it. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. He's well pleased with that. We can bring a, we can bring a heifer in here and say, well, me, absolutely nothing at all. We look ignorant. But God said, just praise me, sing to me, love me, worship me. Yeah. Amen. He said, I'm pleased with that, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the forgivenesses of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, amen, acceptable unto God. Acceptable. God, there's some things that's acceptable, God, and not. Which is your reasonable service, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove. I got some things to prove, let's go. I know a lot of people in my lifetime. I'm talking about a lot of people, a lot of bad people. And I've got a lot to prove to them. I can't do the proving outside of God doing it in their heart of salvation, but my change ought to show. Your change ought to show. How? Because we're transformed. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. God tells us we go and we do. Amen. God, if God be for us, who could be against us? The world cannot be against you and I. We need to go for God. We need worship. So he said, he said Lord, I'm scared to go back there and I just killed... Agleg, a king that Saul kept, you've had me rebuke him and deny him and reject him. Now you're telling me to go back, and I'm scared because he might kill me. He said, just go worship. <laughs> just go worship. Sometimes that's what we got to do. We just got to worship. Question four, what specific directions did God give Samuel, and what did he not tell him? We see in the next verse, he said, and Jesse and called Jesse, he said, get the heifer, and go and sacrifice. And he said, tell him I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
And three, and called Jesse to the sacrifice. That was David's dad and all these other boys' dad. And I will shew thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. So what specific direction did God give Samuel, and what did he not yet tell him? He told him to invite Jesse to the sacrifice, which means they had to sanctify themselves. There was a process they had to go through of cleaning themselves and preparing themselves, and then Samuel would anoint them, and then they could sacrifice, amen, uh, unto God. They could worship God. And he told him he was going there because he had prepared a king. He said that he had prepared somebody uh, for him to go to. He gave him so much direction and then cut him off. Why? It ain't no different from the prophets as it is then, but that we got to walk by faith and not by sight. See, he'll give us so much direction in what we're supposed to do to give us enough to keep us going, and then he'll let us know when it comes to the point of needing to continue which way to go, where to go, how to go, what to do. But we've got to have faith today. See, God's always directed his men and women uh, by faith. Amen. He invited him. God gave him enough direction without the entirety of his will. Amen. Without the entirety of his will that he would walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. He said, Samuel, just go. Take your heifer. You're there. Go to the house of Jesse. And I've got a man there that I'm going to anoint as king. And you just go. He didn't know exactly who it was. But Sam said, okay, Lord, I'm going. We must do the same. We must walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. Next question says, what truth did God give Samuel when he was considering Elab? So he's gotten there. They've sanctified themselves. They've cleansed themselves. They've, they've done their sacrifice to this heifer. And now he's starting to bring the boys in. And he brings the oldest one in. Amen. And we see in verses 4 through 7, we're going to read these verses. And I want to point something out. Verse 4, he says, And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. See, God don't keep pointing. And see, he didn't say, Samuel, 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 Samuel. He just assured him that you're going to do something, go do it, and then he did it. Amen. Those things happen in our walk with God. It says, And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming. So now all the elders of the town seen Samuel coming. Why are they trembling? They knew he was a true man of God. And they knew that I was supposed to. He'd take a sword out and then cut Aglag into pieces. Uh, hey man, he's a man of God with a sword. I mean, my soul. And he's, he's allowed to use it. I mean, hey man, praise <laughs> yeah, you, Are you seeing it? Hey man. Hey, he's a man of God with a sword and he's allowed to use it. And then in question, in verse 5, uh, they sanctified themselves, hey Amen. And, uh, and did their sacrifice. But then in verse 6 it says, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Elab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The oldest boy is before Samuel and he's thinking to himself, Boy, here he is. Look at him. In verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature. He must have been a, a tall glass of water. Is that what they say? Because I have refused him... For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Praise the Lord. So what truth did God give Samuel when he was considering Elab? He told him he's not it. His looks get him nowhere. Our looks, the outward appearing, does absolutely nothing. He's the God that looks into the heart. What did the Bible say about David? He said he was a man after my own heart. Heart. It's always about the integrity. Watch it. God is an interior designer. Amen. He ain't worried about the outside until he first gets the inside. Amen. What is it worth? What is it any good? Uh, hey, man, I'm going to give this to you. What is it any good uh, that you cut your grass outside and everything looks clean and then you invite people in and your house is a wreck? Amen. Everything's dirty, nasty, stinky, nothing kept up with. Amen. God first works on the inside. And then he works on the outside. Amen. Hallelujah. Who don't like the grass cut? Who don't like the outside to look well? At least get some of the grass cut down and things like that, right? Amen. God is an interior designer. He's saying, that's not him. Let me remind you, too, that when they went to war, them two boys was too sissified. Amen. They were too sissy. Might have looked good, but it was too sissified to go fight that giant, wasn't he? Yeah. Amen. They didn't. And then here come, here come little David. God sent David 
with some sandwiches for his brothers, so to say. Paraphrasing, amen. He said, I'll take him on. I've already fought a bear. I've already fought a lion. If God be for me, who could be against me? This, this giant ain't nothing. Amen, praise the Lord. And God said he looks at the heart of man. So he reminded him that he looks. See, God, God's not of a man that he should lie. And God is a spirit. Amen. God looks on the inward things. The Bible is very clear. And it says the heart is deceitful, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord. He said he tries the reins and the heart. He knows the mind and he knows the heart. Sometimes we go through things and we go through battles just like Samuel did right before this point, right? When he got fearful about going and doing the next step God told him to do. Amen. We're not, we're not completely unfearful, undoubtable. Uh, amen. Though we're supposed to be working on those things, go, though God sanctifying us and he's preparing us and helping us to get better, hey, those things do arise. Yeah. But it's all about the heart. Amen. What does the outside Jesus, I mean Jesus, they talk about men that preach it hard. I mean Jesus preached it real hard. He said, you a generation of vipers. Amen. He said, you look good on the outside. He said, but in the inside you're filthy. He said, you look white sepulchers, dirty, rotten bones inside. Amen. God's the God that looks in the heart. And ain't you glad, ain't you glad he looks into the heart? I'm glad he looks into the heart. And I'm glad he looks into my heart every day. And David, David said, Lord, in my heart, he said, cleanse me, renew me with thy free spirit, O God. He said, look into my heart and cleanse me. That's the kind of guy he was. He knew he had a sinful state. He knew he had a sinful uh, and, 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 and desirable flesh, uh, but he wanted his heart right with God. Eli wasn't this kind of guy. The outside looked good, but God reminded Samuel, remember Samuel, it's, all about the heart, and I don't see as you see. Question number six. Yes, sir. Uh, the reason he turned down the biggest boy, who did uh, Israel want to be their king and why? They wanted Saul. Why? Because he was head and shoulders above everybody else. Yes, sir. So man always, thank you, sir. Man always looks on the outside. What, it, what he stated was why did they want Saul? They wanted Saul because... He was head and shoulders and he was above the rest. See, they already had, you got to be reminded, and if we step back maybe six or seven months ago, we had that, that Sunday school lesson there. Uh, they had the king, but they desired a physical king. They, they desired a physical king. Somebody, And they did the same thing in the time of Jesus. Uh, amen. They did the same thing. They wanted to take him as king, but that wasn't what he was there for. He was die, there to die for the sin of the world and be king spiritually. Uh, amen. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Uh, question number six says, uh, why is this truth just as important for us today as it was then? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi chapter three, I change not. Amen. It don't matter what you have when you leave this world, what you got, the people that know you or don't know you, what matters is your relationship with God Almighty. Amen. It's about your heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. I tell you, when you start getting your heart right, uh, I just read a sign this morning that said, uh, on a church, it said, uh, walk with those that are wise and you'll become wise. I said, amen. Walk with Jesus. Praise the Lord. If you'll walk with God, if you'll walk with the Word of God, you can become wiser and wiser. See, Jesus wasn't, wasn't a militant type guy. He didn't come fighting. He didn't come defending. He didn't come trying to break things down. You know what he did? He came allowing people to use him. He allowing people to abuse him. But he got stronger in that. And he got stronger and they knew there was something different. He got God Almighty on his side. His life is but a vapor. They're going to use you for a while. They're going to abuse you for the while. But inside that heart is strong and it'll go and it'll go and it'll go and it'll last. It's about the integrity of man. It's all about what's on the inside. And buddy, I promise you, when you start getting right on the inside, it starts showing on the outside. In your lifestyle, in everything about you, it shows. I was reading a book just not too long ago and it says, from a distance you can tell an old time Christian. 
See, he was over in the book of Philemon, and he was talking about how he wrote just one, just one little verse down and had a sermon. The fellow's going to be here, uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Barker. And he said this, uh, the prisoner of Christ, and he started mentioning things about prisoners and how we're a prisoner of Christ, amen, and how they, when you go to prison, what are they usually wearing? They're on apparel, right? They're wearing something real bright orange, something that stands out. He didn't say nothing else. All these, this booger pages on points, but this point right there, it's all it said. And he said, you can tell an old-time Christian, right? You can tell an old-time Christian from a distance. Amen. Amen. When, you, when he gets inside, bless God, the more I feel, I, I'm just that way. You might be different than me, and I'm not saying, you're, I'm not saying that you're wrong. But the closer I get to God, the more I want to cover up. The more I realize my, my sinful flesh and how I desire to have that new body fashioned like unto His glorious Amen. body. Amen. I want to be more like God. I want to be wise. I need that with that relationship with God. And He's reminding him here, that's why it's so important for us today. The same as it was then is the same now. God is looking at the heart of man. You want victory? You want power over this world, over sin? Start walking with God by the integrity of of your heart. Don't just read this book as you've got to. We'll do you no good. If you do this just to be religious, just to say I did it today, whew, now I'm hurry up and, get in some, and read it and never receive nothing from God, you've missed the point. Because it's the only book you'll ever read that the author is present every time you read it. God will speak to you through this book no matter where you're at in it every single day. God will do that. But you must read this book that God can speak to you. Amen. Joseph? Amen. Praise the Lord. The, 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 the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Amen. And we've got to have that fear of God. When you have that fear of God, it's a reverence. It's not being scared. You ought to be scared if you're lost since you're going to hell. But it's a, it's a reverence. I have a reverence for God. I need His leadership. I need Him to work on my heart in the integrity of my heart. Amen. I want to go forward, not backwards. Amen. So He's reminding him that uh, Elab, uh, he's, he looks apart, uh, but he's not it. And why is that the same for us today? Because he don't change. And God's word about the heart of man. Amen. He's correcting the heart of man. He's sanctifying the heart of man. He's preparing the heart of man. Question seven. Why was it logical for Jesse to present his sons in order of age? Then eight through ten it said, Then Jesse called Abinadab, and he goes through his sons, and he said he wasn't it. Verse 9, Shimon, he said he wasn't it. He hadn't chosen him. And then verse 10, it says, And again, Jesse made seven of his sons a pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto them, Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen thee. So why was it logical for the men, for his dad, Jesse, to say, start with the oldest, and then he started going through the youngest? Because it had been like that in, in man's tradition since the ancient of time. Can I tell you, it ain't about man's tradition. I know we have certain tradition in the Bible according to the to the word of God, but it reminds you that God don't see as man sees. Amen. God does not see as man sees. I have met young people, bless God, young people, one-fourth of their parents' age and got more wisdom in the things of God than their parents do. Yeah. I promise you. It's about the heart. It's about God. Amen. Remember he said perfect praise from the mouth of Bane. Right, And then we ought to be praising God continually, which is a sacrifice God is uh, pleased with. Amen. Praise the Lord. So why did he present them this way, the dad? Uh, it was just been like that. That's custom, but God don't see as man sees. Question eight, how was God probably uh, communicating with Samuel? And why should this be an encouragement to us? We'll continue reasoning, it says, and then 11 says, And Samuel said to Jesse, here are all thy children. He said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send him, fetch him, for he will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready with all the beautiful countenance and goodly to look on. Watch it. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So how did God probably communicate with Saul? You think he opened up the heavens and, and thou art my son and who I'm well pleased? No. He did that for Jesus Christ. But he was speaking to his spirit. When you stay in this book, 
And when you pray, I promise you, when you do the things of God, God will speak to you. He will speak to you. People said, has God got a voice? Have you not read your Bible? God will speak to you. That's what he was doing. And when you get this equation, you walk that close with God, I can walk, you can walk right in front of somebody, and they be saying something, the Lord's speaking to you. But they said, we can't continually pray. If you stay plugged in the things of God, you can constantly be hearing from God. It's called discernment. It's called knowing better. It's walking with Jesus. It's being directed uh, the right way. Amen. Watch it. Hebrews chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. We're running out of time. It says, God who had sundry times in different times and in divers manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heirs of all things by whom also he made the worlds. In the beginning by his son. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Read your book and God will speak to you. I promise you he'll lead you and he'll guide you and speak to you. That ought to be an encouragement. When our spirit, lowercase s, lines up with the spirit, capital S, we know when things are right and when they're wrong. When God opens up a door, you'll go through it. If it's something that's not supposed to be, God will shut that door, he'll shut that door, he'll shut that door, and bless God, you'll know it until you get the picture to walk away. Stop doing that. God's done that plenty of times in my ministry. But if things are supposed to be the way the Lord wants them to, door open, door open, door open, door open, you'll just keep on walking, you never stop. See, he's a God of forwardness. He ain't a God to just hinder you and stop you. So if you ever get to a point in your walk with God where you're doing this, and you're questioning, and you're doubting something's wrong, he's a God of forwardness. He don't stop. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's constantly forward climbing. Amen? So you and I can hear the voice of God if we'll line up in the things of God. Question number nine says, how does the text describe David? We just read it in verse 12. It says that he was ruddy. Uh, they say that this probably means he had red hair. And it says, and with all of a beautiful countenance. It means he was, he was a good-looking fellow. Amen. But that's, I don't see that in this question. It said, how to describe him? It says, and goodly looked to him. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. He was chosen. Bless God. God knew who he was. He had already been preparing him while he was watching over the sheep and the things he had been through in his life and preparing him uh, for what God had for him. Lastly, our last question, uh, 10. What did the anointing and the coming of the Spirit do for David? Our last verse, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit, capital S, of the Lord came from David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So what did it do? It prepared him. See, because Saul was still king over the people. We fast forward through time. We know all the stories. He wanted to kill David, and he, David's running at times, and uh, Saul looked like he had the upper hand, but eventually Saul winds up falling on his sword. Uh, king, uh, David becomes king. Uh, in that time, that oil, did, that, that oil did absolutely nothing. It was symbolic. Baptizing you in water will do absolutely nothing. It's symbolic. But it does prepare. Amen. It prepares you. You've got to take steps in the Lord. And this was it. Because there was more anointings for King David that was to come. But the fact of the matter is, he was anointed. Oh God, look, I've been, I've been ordained into the ministry. And to be honest, I didn't quite see the need for it because I already knew I was ordained of God. I was called of God. You and I, from God, the Bible says that you and I are a peculiar people, zealous unto good works. You have been ordained. You have been set aside. You are, you're here for a reason, for the things of God. We just got to fall in place. We just got to do it. Now, we do these things to keep a structure. The Bible says do all things decent and in order. So that's why we do ordinations and set this here and that. But we need more godly leaders. People that realize they're chosen of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Settle the score that I've been born again. I've repented of sin. And go for Jesus. See, this anointing here started preparing him uh, to be king and his ministry. But not only that, it was preparing his heart more and more. See, the more that your heart is prepared, the more you can help others have their heart prepared. And I tell you, friend, listen to me. I see a lot of people on their deathbed. I see them in hospital rooms. I see them inside here and there. Can I tell you, friend, the most important thing for you ever to do is to have your heart prepared before God. Father, in Jesus' name, as we humbly bow before you, Lord, we thank you, God. Another option.